Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by PSCNG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. Hackensack Meridian Health, keep getting better. The New Jersey Education Association. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Here when you need us most, now and always. Prudential Financial. Kane University, where cougars climb higher. And by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The way we change presidents in this country is by voting. I'm hopeful that, that this is the beginning to accountability. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. I did do the finale, and guess where my trailer was? A block away from my apartment. It couldn't have been better. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. It's not all about memorizing and getting information. It's what you do with that information. Start, start talking, talking right, right, right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Adubato. Uh, yes, we are in a new set, new uh, location, if you will, for a brand new series that is called Remember Them. And I'm joined by our executive producer of Remember Them and my co-host introducing this program. Jackie, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you doing? I'm great. So people are saying, wait a minute, we're looking here. It's one-on-one. -on -one. What, what am I watching here? And Steve is with his colleague, Jackie Chikarico. We've been working together for many years. For those who have no idea, which they shouldn't unless they go on our website, steveoutabout.org, what Remember Them is, what is it and why is it so important, Jackie? Well, first, let me just say, Steve, I'm so honored to be joining you to co-host this new series. And we're going to be able to celebrate um, some talented and memorable people who have come out of the great state of New Jersey. We're going to use this platform to take a deeper look at some of the greats from all walks of life, from the incomparable Whitney Houston to actor James Gandolfini, baseball legends Yogi Berra and Larry Doby, founding father Alexandra Hamilton, uh, even you know some political powerhouses like Congresswoman Melissa Fenwick and even uh, President Grover Cleveland. So I'm excited to kick the show off with you today and uh, start talking the one and only Frank Sinatra up first. Okay, so, so I was going to say, uh, if people are wondering who we're kicking off Remember Them with, uh, I have been obsessed with growing up in Newark, New Jersey, whether it's Newark or Brooklyn or the Bronx or Philadelphia or other communities where a large number, and I'm not just saying just Italian-Americans <clears throat> really appreciate it, Frank Sinatra, because he was an iconic figure for so many. But growing up in the community I grew up in, in Newark, New Jersey, people had pictures of the Pope and Frank Sinatra. That's not a joke. It's real. And back in 2016, I sat down with James Kaplan, who's actually the author of that book called The Chairman. He also is the author of this book. It's extraordinary. If you want to check out on our website, steveoutabout.org, we're also bringing you to books that help you remember certain people. This is called The Voice, James Kaplan, the quintessential biographer, if you will, of Frank Sinatra. I remember that interview. We did it at the WNET Tisch studio, Jackie, back in 2016. What are some of the keys that really should stand out for people as they watch this interview? James Kaplan talks a lot. He's he's a historian of Frank Sinatra. He knows anything and everything you need to know about him. Um, so he goes into some, some things like his his contribution or his influence in politics, which a lot of people might not know some of those uh, certain things about him and uh, his specific relationship with uh, the Kennedys. Um, and, you know, his- Complicated, Jackie. It is complicated. complicated. And He's first Kaplan with JFK in 1960. He holds a rally. There's a birthday party at Madison Square Garden for um, Jack Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe get the connection here. Sinatra introduced Kennedy to Marilyn Monroe. You read about the rest. And that event was one of many in which money was raised for Jack Kennedy's presidential campaign. He was supportive of the Kennedys. He was close to the Kennedys. After a while, things did not turn out after that. And Kaplan talks about that extensively in this interview. 
Right. And also I found it super interesting that uh, he kind of jumped party lines later on and then backed Ronald Reagan, right? He backed Reagan. He backed a lot of Republicans because he felt jilted by the Kennedys. Listen, I'm not a historian, as Jackie said, about James Kaplan. He'll tell that story, but I will tell you that Sinatra got older. He became a Republican, moved away from the progressive. He was a civil right. He was active in the civil rights movement. He was very close to let me tell you something. Sammy Davis Jr. was part of the so-called Rat Pack with Sinatra and uh, Dean Martin and Joey Bishop. And there was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Sammy Davis Jr. And a lot of places back at that time would not even allow Sammy Davis Jr. to perform or to be in a hotel. And Sinatra made it clear to everyone, if Sammy's not with us, if he can't stay in the same place, then we're not performing. He stood up. He was progressive. He was a Democrat. Over time, he switched parties and has switched his affiliation. But in this interview, uh, a lot of this comes out. Also, his relationship with the mob, Jackie. There's yes. no other way to say There's he... a mafia connection. There's a mafia connection. So let's just say this. In the 1960 presidential election, uh, Jack Kennedy beats Richard Nixon. Kennedy got a lot of votes in Illinois, more specifically in Chicago. The boss, the, the mafia boss in Chicago was Sam Giancana had a close relationship with Frank Sinatra. Bottom line is, uh, a lot of people question how all those votes came out of Chicago and whether, in fact, talk about elections that people question. 1960, a lot of people question all those votes that came out of Chicago and whether the mob influenced that election. Ironically, a little bit later on, when Robert Kennedy was appointed attorney general, he went after the mob first victim, Sam Giancana. Things did not work out with the Kennedys and Sinatra after that. But also, Jackie, before we go into this James Kaplan interview, real quick, there are a couple of people we need to thank organizations as it relates to Remember Them, who have been instrumental. When you see a lot of the pictures or the video, it comes from a lot of these folks. Please, Jackie. Well, you know, we want to thank the New Jersey Hall of Fame because we've kind of partnered with them um, because a lot of these folks that we're going to be honoring, including Frank Sinatra, are New Jersey Hall of Fame inductees. Frank Sinatra is actually in the first class of inductees in, in the New Jersey Hall of Fame in 2008. And um, just last week, Steve, uh, the Atlantic County um, service area, which is actually down by my dad's house, and I saw the new sign up this past weekend when I was visiting my dad and my sister, it is now called the Frank. Sinatra service area. And uh, we're going to be seeing these name changes throughout the state at a ton of service areas, renaming them to honor some of these New Jersey Hall of Fame inductees and some of the folks we're honoring here on Remember Them, like Larry Adobe and Celia Cruz. So uh, these are going to be popping up all over the state. So we'll see that as well. So New Jersey Hall of Fame is just an excellent resource. You can log on to their website and learn more about some of these New Jersey icons that uh, they've remembered, they've been honoring, and that we're going to be remembering remembering here on this series. Yeah, the Historical Commission of Society, the Hall of Fame, so many other folks. So here, here we go. Uh, and Jackie, again, uh, I would argue that regardless of your age, regardless of where you come from, Frank Sinatra, Hoboken's own, also check out the Frank Sinatra Museum in Hoboken, came from Hoboken, came from virtually nothing, impacted not just New Jersey, not just the nation, but the world, an iconic figure. His music lives on, even though he's been gone for a long time. Uh, so we go to this interview with James Kaplan from 2016 uh, at the, the Tish WNET studio. This is Remember Them. I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, our executive producer, Jackie Chicarico, Frank Sinatra. One of my favorite all-time authors we have in the house, back um, again, James Kaplan, the author of Sinatra, The Chairman. Uh, boy, I'll tell you, this is a great book. And Thank you, um, Steve. Sinatra, The Voice, last time around. Frank, The Voice, Sinatra, The Chairman. <clears throat> yeah. So let me ask you, what makes this one different? It starts in 1954. Yes. He's just won the Academy Award for? He's just won the Academy <clears throat> Award for From Here to Eternity. He plays... Private Maggio. Maggio. Yes. Tell everyone why Maggio, that character, is so significant 
Sinatra believed he was Maggio. Sinatra believed he was Maggio. Maggio was, uh, he was from Brooklyn, not Hoboken, but he was a skinny, small Italian American who was downtrodden. Everybody walked all over him. And in a lot of ways, especially after World War II, when his career went down the tubes, Sinatra felt very downtrodden. So the role was a natural <clears throat> for him. James, explain to folks. Uh, my wife was actually asking me, Jennifer was asking me last night, knowing that I was doing the interview, she said, why did Sinatra's career, quote, go down the, downhill oh, after that? Why? Oh, boy, a lot of reasons. First of all, his record stopped selling after the war. During the war, he sang these ballads of longing that were perfect for wartime. After the war, popular <clears throat> music changed. Everything <clears throat> got very perky, a lot of novelty songs. He wasn't good at doing those. He didn't like them. That was one thing. That was just one thing. But Was but, the Ava Gardner thing the other thing? Well, that was a big other thing. And there was also the fact that Frank was cited at a mafia conference in Havana in 1947. And there was a Hearst columnist, columnist from the Hearst papers there, cited Frank having dinner with Lucky Luciano and started writing these columns about Frank. It was a very conservative time politically. Frank was also an FDR liberal, and the Hearst papers didn't like him for that. They hated the fact that he was cited with Lucky Luciano. Then suddenly, he's stepping out with Ava Gardner. This is a married guy with three little kids at home. He became uh, like a devil in How many the years? eyes of America. How many years was he having a real tough time? From about 1947 until, yeah. until he won that Oscar. Seven and, years bad luck. And, and James, did he have to fight to get the role of Maggio? He had to fight, Ava Gardner had to fight for him. She had gotten sick of him at that point. He was such a loser. Her movie career was going straight up. His was going down. She went to the head of Columbia Pictures. Harry Cohn, who was the biggest lech in Hollywood, told him that she would give him a, she would do a free picture for him. And he looked her up and down and thought, what else is she going to give me for free? And he gave Sinatra the screen test. It turned out that the other guy who did a good screen test, Eli Wallach, was doing a play in New York, and Frank got the role. It was no horse's head. You know, it was not. There was uh, not. Yeah. So explain to folks, uh, may I reference to The Godfather, um, uh, an offer you couldn't refuse, another reference that may or may not have happened. But here's yeah. the thing. How does winning the Academy Award for From Here to Eternity, Maggio, yes. change Frank Sinatra's professional life? It changes everything because before that he was seen as a loser in Hollywood whose career was over. He had a friend, a literary agent named Swifty Lazar and Swifty Lazar said he's a dead man. Swifty Lazar said even Jesus couldn't get resurrected in this town. Well, Sinatra could and he did. From the night he won that Oscar, his career started going straight back uphill instead of downhill. What kind of things happened for him? A big deal was that he had started even his record company, Columbia, dropped him uh, in, during, his, during his bad years. Right. But he was mm. picked up by a new company, Capitol Records. Columbia to Capitol. Columbia to Capitol. And he was introduced to a great arranger, young mm. arranger he had never heard of. Is that Nelson Riddle? That is Nelson Riddle. And he started making these incredible albums with Nelson Riddle. And between the movie career being reborn and these incredible Capitol albums with Nelson Riddle, it was a career that shot up like a rocket in the 50s. Help me on this. The night that Sinatra wins the Academy Award, does he go home alone? Yes. He goes home alone. He goes home alone. He goes home alone. He had been, don't forget, at this point, this is 1954, he has left his, the mother of his children and his children. He had gone to Big Nancy's house before the Academy Awards. Big Nancy, his wife. Big Nancy is his wife. Is Ava Gardner in Spain? Ava Gardner is overseas. She is taken up with a bullfighter in Spain. That is that bullfighter in Spain. That is that bullfighter okay. in Spain. So Frank has no wife. He stopped by to see his ex-wife, but he can't go yeah. back to her house right. after he wins the Oscar. He's alone. He's walking around Beverly Hills, holding on to the statuette. He sits down on the steps of a church, and he just has to think. His yeah. life has changed, but he's got nobody to tell it to. Um, the book also covers politics. Yes. Sinatra and the Kennedys, go. Sinatra met Jack Kennedy at a uh, Democratic fundraiser in L.A. in 1955, <clears throat> and these were two guys who instantly fell in love with each other. Jack Kennedy loved women. He loved beautiful women. He was a married man, but that didn't mean much to him, and in those days, politicians, especially attractive, charismatic politicians, were allowed to do what they wanted without being outed by the press. 
He loved beautiful women. Sinatra was the A number one world source of beautiful women. And he was knocked out by Sinatra's stardom, by his singing. Sinatra was an FDR liberal, died in the wool Democrat. He saw this incredibly charismatic young politician and thought, this guy's going to be president. And so, and, and Sinatra was always attracted to power. And Kennedy had it in spades. So the two were made for each other. Kennedy, the Kennedy chef, Sinatra. Well, this is how it works. In Sinatra's mind. In, in, well, it, it was a shafting, and it was a public humiliation. In March of 1962, Jack Kennedy was going west. Uh, he was going to uh, spend some R&R time at Sinatra's Palm Springs house. And uh, there was probably <clears throat> going to be a little bit of uh, 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 naughtiness that would go on there. His brother, Jack Kennedy's brother, Bobby Kennedy, was Attorney General of the United States. And Bobby Kennedy had just been informed by J. Edgar Hoover that the President of the United States had a lady friend, a woman named Judith Campbell. Who had the relationship with Sam Giancana. Who had a relationship with the head of the Chicago mob, Sam, Sam Giancana. Giancana. Yeah. At the same time, she was having the relationship with Jack Kennedy. Judith Campbell had been introduced to Jack Kennedy by Frank Sinatra, and Bobby Kennedy said to his brother, you may not stay at his house. Is that how he winds up, Kennedy winds up staying at Bing Crosby's Stayed house? Stayed at Bing Crosby's house instead, and that was a huge public humiliation for Sinatra. Sinatra took it all out, never got mad at Jack Kennedy, took it all out on Bobby Kennedy yeah. and on Peter Lawford. Peter Lawford, who was a uh, who was an married, in law to the Kennedy family. Yeah, married to Jack's sister. Um, some of the other major themes in, in the book that really matter. Uh, Jerry Lewis' relationship matter here? I think they did a lot of benefits together, but largely Jerry has always said to me, you know, I did a book with Jerry. Jerry yeah. said that, that he and Frank really moved in different worlds. That had mostly to do with the fact that, that Dean Martin and Frank were so close. Uh, the, the Dean Martin thing, uh, big theme in the book? Big theme in the book. Close, but not close. Close, but not close. That's correct. I don't correct. get it. You have, to, you have to look at the psychology of Dean Martin. He was a strange cat. He was a guy who was, he was so gifted. He was incredibly handsome. He was everything that Sinatra wanted to be. He was big, tall, strong, handsome. He had handsome. been a boxer in Cleveland. Could have been a boxer, and, except. And, was, and, and he was tied to the mob. He had mob friends in well, Cleveland. Yes, he did. And they helped him a little bit. But, but Dean could sing. He could sing wonderfully, yes. although he always made fun of his own singing. And the most valuable gift that Dean Martin had was he had an incredible sense of humor. Yes. An incredible sense. Quick a, timing. A, a, a lightning timing. And Sinatra idolized Dean Martin. And Dean Martin always kept himself at a distance from everybody, even from Frank. He also pulled away at times when he didn't want to party anymore, Yes, as I read in the book. You know, I recently saw Tony Bennett. Uh, my wife and I went to see Tony Bennett at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, 89 years young. Mm. And the way he's introduced <clears throat> is, and you know this, he's introduced with a voice track mm. from Sinatra saying, I want to introduce this young kid. Yes. The guy yes. who's got the greatest voice out there today. Yes. Tony yes. Bennett. Tony Bennett. Go ahead. Amazing singer. Big difference between Sinatra and Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett brought to his singing a quality of joy. You hear joy in hearing Tony Bennett sing. Sinatra never brought joy to his singing. Sinatra was like a walking opera. Everything was dramatic. Tragic? You, uh, tragic to a great degree, although when he's singing songs like You Make Me Feel So Young, I Got the World on a String, Fly Me to the Moon, you hear a great deal of buoyancy and... Uh, and, uh, and, and positive mm. energy, but not joy. Joy was not something in Sinatra's wheelhouse. Mm. Need to ask you this. By Please. the way, the book is called The Chairman. Ask, Sinatra. Ask me anything. The Chairman. Here's my question. <laughs> Sinatra's 100th birthday. Yes. Right? We celebrate it. December 12th. 100 years from now, James yes. Kaplan, will we still be talking about Frank Sinatra? Absolutely. Because? Will, because of that voice. People are fascinated with Sinatra today, and even young people are fascinated with him because of uh, a combination of the mystique and the voice, that rat pack swagger, right, and the voice. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. So there you have it, James Kaplan from uh, 2016 over in New York at Lincoln Center, more specifically the Tisch WNET studio. Jackie, okay, switching gears. 
Sinatra's songs, his voice, if you will, I mentioned Kaplan's, the voice. Is there a song for you that resonates uh, and connects with you or your family in any way, Sinatra's song? Well, it's funny. Uh, I have a story back when I was in high school. Uh, I start I started my introduction into television broadcasting. My high school had a really cool TV studio. And we would broadcast the news every morning. So I took some editing classes in high school as well. And our assignment was to edit together a new movie trailer for a movie that we loved at the time. And the movie that I decided to pick was Finding Nemo. And the song Beyond the Sea it is a song that you hear in Finding Nemo. And that song just resonates with me because I use that as the backdrop of this uh, this editing project that I created. And uh, that just brings me back to the memory of falling in love with television broadcasting, knowing that that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my career. And then fast forward to today, look where we are. And that song plays in my head pretty often beyond the sea and that connection for me. So uh, I love that song. And uh, it was funny this morning, I was talking to my young daughters about Frank Sinatra. And that's who I was going to be talking to you about today. And uh, my daughter said, who's Frank Sinatra? And I said, oh, geez, no, I have to make sure you know his songs. And they will eventually know them, even if I don't introduce them to them. Because like you said, it's just... The, the songs will live on forever. His voice will live yep. on forever. What about for you? Know, yeah. Well, for me, it's not that song. There's, okay, check this movie out. Uh, it didn't get a lot of play, but it was one of my favorites. There's a genre, if you will, that I was obsessed with um, in my uh, formative years. In 1984, the movie, The Pope of Greenwich Village. Uh, and it's Mickey Rourke, Eric Roberts. It opens up on West 4th Street, New York City in a in a, um, a playground there that, that I know well, a lot of people in New York know well, and the song that's playing while they're playing stickball is Frank Sinatra's Summer Wind. And it is uh, an incredibly powerful song. Every summer down at the Jersey Shore, that song plays in my head. Uh, it reminds me of that movie. It connects me to so many things in, in my childhood, but that was Sinatra, Summer Wind. But also, Jackie, I, did I ever tell you that I never liked it? I'm a longtime Yankee fan, right? Uh, and I know the song that plays at the end of every game, right? New York, New York. I don't love it. You don't love New York, New York. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I get it. I understand why it's iconic. It's important. It's New York, New York, but that's not, I get it. Not my favorite. I'm just nothing against it. I understand, and, but man, that song, just when I hear it, it just resonates with me so much. It just gives me the feels. It makes me want to get into the city again. I haven't been there in so long and walk the streets in New York. And you, there's nothing like that New York vibe, but bringing it back over the river into Hoboken, that is where Frank Sinatra was born and raised. And Hoboken really um, is a place where you can learn more about Frank Sinatra, right? There's still these walking tours that you can get through the Hoboken Museum. Um, you can go on these walking tours and learn more about Frank Sinatra's past and living there. Uh, and just last year, they put up a brand new statue of Frank Sinatra in Hoboken on the water. Our friend Joe Piscopo, on the radio at AM 970. I think he hosted that event. He has a Sinatra show he does every week on the radio. He was there. It was a big gathering, and that just shows that Hoboken, it is, it's, it's the home of Frank Sinatra, and you feel it there, and there's so many really cool places that you can take a look at and learn more about him there. And Steve, I do want to ask you before we uh, wrap all this up, I know that your family has a certain history. Uncle don't Mikey, go there, Jackie. Frank Jackie, Sinatra, don't go there. Atlantic City? I, th I think we need to hear this story. <laughs> this is real quick. Got two minutes left. So Frank Sinatra, big star uh, at the time. You know, he's in Atlantic City. He's gambling. And I, forget, I don't even want to say what hotel he was at, casino was at. He's there, and he wants the dealer who happens to be a woman who happens to be Asian American. And this is not one of Sinatra's best moments. His temper got the best of him. It was terrible. She wanted, he wanted her to deal out of the shoe, which you have to deal in the shoe. It comes out of the shoe. He said... And she said, no, Mr. Sinatra, I have to. And he started calling her all kinds of names, including making reference to her ethnicity. And he then said, and they threw him out of the hotel. And he said, I'm not performing here anymore. And my uncle, uh, the late Mike Adubato, who was in the state legislature, and I was a very young legislator at 25 at the time, my uncle put a resolution up having the state officially apologize to Frank Sinatra for what happened in Atlantic City. And I was against it because I thought Sinatra acted terribly. There was a big brouhaha, an old school word, down the legislature. Virtually no one voted for my uncle's legislation or my uncle's resolution because Sinatra acted like a jerk. I hate ending the show like this, but it's true. And he didn't perform in New Jersey 
forever. Well, listen, I grew up down by Atlantic City. That just shows it doesn't matter who you are, Frank Sinatra, anyone. You don't mess around and try to try to change the rules in Atlantic City. It just don't. And you do don't abuse people who work hard for a living, whether they're dealers or waiters, waitresses, people who work hard. Listen, Frank Sinatra is a complex figure, great voice, iconic figure. But there was another side to him as well. And that's the case with a lot of the people that virtually all the people and Remember Them. So I want to say this to Jackie Tricarico and the team, to Georgette and the entire team at Remember Them, who've done so much to make this series possible. We kick off Remember Them with Frank Sinatra. I, again, I made that call. Whether you like it or not, that's on me. So you see our website, you can give that to me. Jackie's our executive producer. She opens and closes the show, co-anchors this series with me. Jackie, it's my honor, my pleasure. A brand new series, it's called Remember Them. I hope they remember us, Jackie. Yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week. More, more fun and amazing people will be honoring on the series. That's what Jackie said. See you then. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSENG, NJM Insurance Group, Hackensack Meridian Health, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Prudential Financial, Kane University, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and by New Jersey Monthly. Many of New Jersey's children have been affected by COVID-19, but now that there is a safe and effective vaccine available for children ages 12 and older, you can help make COVID-19 history by getting yourself and your child vaccinated. Let's end this pandemic together and help all children get back to being kids. Visit HackensackMeridianHealth.org slash COVID-19 to learn more or to schedule a vaccine appointment today.